The next one, I will also introduce this, the other, the other wonderful doctor, and he is, she is the speaker, Professor Aruna Adaran. Uh, Professor, Pro Professor Aruna Adaran, he is the uh, association, associate professor, uh, department of OBGYN University of Malaya. You know, also sec secretary, uh, gynecology endoscopic society of Malaysia, and also vice president, young APH group, and uh, while also vice president, and uh, you know, also president and the chief of the University of the Malaya Medical Alumni Association, and uh, also the APH committee member, and uh, Professor Dr. Edelman, I will be being called Sangam Member Hospital. She is a wonderful doctor and is a very kindness. And I'm very happy and my honor here to introduce this, this wonderful doctor. Uh, Dr. Adonan, Adonan will give us a very wonderful topic. He will talk about the diagnosis of a placenta aprita and the cesarean, cesarean session, the scar pregnancy. Actually, we are OBGYN doctor. We all know this topic is a very, very important because maybe it's a crisis of the early pregnancy, the woman and mother. So that's it. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Aruna Anand, please. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Chang. Uh, it's so nice to be called back again to present on something. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, thank you Professor Lee and Professor Susumi for inviting me over for this talk. Now I have been given the uh, task of actually talking about the diagnosis of placenta accreta and caesarean pregnancy. And specifically, we are to be looking at the clinical protocols and its outcomes. So, yes. Uh, all right. So yes, that is me. Thank you again for this invitation. Now, let me just take you back again through to the definition so that we are clear in a very short uh, period of time. What was previously known as a morbidly adherent placenta, okay, is what we now know as a placenta accreta spectrum. And that includes the increta, okay, where it is, uh, the placenta is attached to the myometrium, okay, and the Accreta, which is what we usually know when it is, uh, you know, it is attached to the uh, to the uterus. Okay, the placenta is attached to the uterus. Hang on, uh, let me see. Am I blocking? Okay, it attaches deeply to the uterine wall, but if it undergoes increasingly, it enters into the uterine muscle. It becomes an increta, and when it goes completely throughout the myometrium sometimes even penetrating into the bladder, we call it a percrita. So we understand that it is because of a defect of the endometrial myometrial interface. So there is a failure of normal decidualization uh, in the area of the uterine scar. Okay, so this will now allow deep placental anchoring, villus, and trophoblast infiltration. Okay, so what happens is that uh, usually the risk factors are perhaps a previous cesarean delivery and previous number of cesarean deliveries. Now, in general, across the board, all right, the generally accepted practice is for a cesarean hysterectomy to be done, either immediately or a delayed cesarean hysterectomy in the sense that the placenta is removed first or the placenta is left behind and immediately we take out the whole thing. So I hope that this uh, webinar will give us share some new ideas on what else we can do for these patients. Okay, so I have uh, collaborated and taken three consensus. One is from America, okay, and uh, from the American College of ONG. Uh, we can see that the um, recommendations are always about making sure that you diagnose it properly with an ultrasound and managing the placenta accreta patients early within the antenatal period, having a standardized approach in a multidisciplinary care team, okay? And for a delivery to be early within 34 to 35 weeks, or maybe 37 weeks at the most, 
And when there is hemorrhage, there must be support with a rapid transfusion protocol and expectant management, if any, should only be considered as long as the patient understands, uh, okay, the uncertain benefits and efficacy of the situation. All right, so these are the recommendations. The British uh, recommendations are a little bit more detailed, but nevertheless, it also covers similar things in the sense that the antenatal diagnosis is important, okay, and if they require a cesarean section, all right, we must alert the antenatal care team of this higher risk, okay? And they also identify that the diagnosis is an ultrasound. And um, I will show you later where they uh, incorporate the usage of MRI. All right. With the Australian and New Zealand uh, protocols, Okay, it is stated, it's a very short protocol, but they say that placenta accreta is difficult to diagnose. But if it is diagnosed, then again, it is the optimization of maternal hemoglobin, iron stores, and medical facilities. Again, they emphasize here has to be available potentially for a hysterectomy and massive blood transfusion. So in essence, all three um, believe, believe in that. Okay, hang on. It has, okay, it has gone a bit too far. Okay, so all right. <clears throat> okay, hang on. It went a bit too far. Yeah, okay, we're here. Okay, so all three actually come up to. Uh, the same conclusion, it is the diagnosis of using an ultrasound, we can incorporate MRI and a multidisciplinary team approach to support in the event there is a need for a hysterectomy and blood transfusion. Um, within the American guidelines, they specifically mention what is to be done pre-operatively, intra-operatively, post-operatively, and it all very much is detailed into a surgical preparation. Uh, situation. Okay, with the uh, British also, again, I think here it is um, a repetition, but they also now suggest that yes, you can use an MRI and the absence of risk, they still suggest a delivery between 35 to 36 weeks, but they uh, suggest also that larger studies are needed to look into the efficacy of radiology, okay, in the diagnosis of uh, placenta accreta spectrum, okay, and the role of interventional radiology needs to be discussed, it is not very clear. Uh, with the Australian guideline, again, they repeat about the usage of cell saver, um, that they must remain close to the hospital for worry that they may bleed and hemorrhage. So the timing of the cesarean section should be considered um, desirable to perform it as an elective rather than that of an emergency procedure. So I know it is a bit of a messy slide, but I have uh, taken, you know, I wanted you to see that in essence, um, they seem to agree on the general management of the placenta accreta. So for the Americans, the hysterectomy is the typical treatment. They highlight, of course, the complications are hemorrhage, injury to your pelvic organs, loss of future fertility. And there are techniques of removal of the placenta, repairing the resulting defect, or even removing the placenta and putting in a battery balloon. And some have also advocated placental cord ligation uh, you know, and then we leave it inside too. Uh, but of course, a patient has to be counseled regarding the risk of infection, sepsis, etc. Um, the British are a little bit more conservative. It is still a cesarean section hysterectomy. And looking at the data with the green top guidelines, also they say that a uterus preserving surgical technique should only be attempted by surgeons, uh, working in teams, expert surgeons, okay, who have the expertise to manage such cases. And they highlighted that there are not enough data to suggest that you should stand the ureters uh, in case uh, you know, you're worried about uh, involving the ureters. There is currently insufficient data, but it may be a role 
if you feel that the urinary bladder is going to be invaded, or at least intraoperatively, you see that it is invaded by the placental tissue. So limited evidence to support uterus preserving surgery in placenta percrita, and they should be informed of a high risk of peripartum and secondary complications, including the need of a secondary hysterectomy if the uterus was preserved in the very beginning. Right, and again, uh, in the Australian guidelines, um, you know, the uh, idea is to deliver the placenta through an incision away from the placenta. This is the recommendation. Trim the cord close to the insertion site, repair the uterus. Okay, you can do that. And it can be a conservative management, but nevertheless, the, uh, data has suggested that two thirds of them, you may avoid a hysterectomy, but one third of them, would still require a hysterectomy because of this uncontrollable bleeding. So yes, I have put it up there again. Um, you can take your time to read on that. Um, with regards to hysteroscopic resection of placental remnants, now a large study shows that um, there were 12 women, okay, who underwent hysteroscopic resection. One required a hysterectomy subsequently, but there were nine successful cases, okay? And they picked up a study uh, with HIFU uh, in conjunction with the hysteroscopic study uh, resection, meaning to say that HIFU was uh, performed and subsequently followed by a hysteroscopic resection. Success in all 25 patients, but nine patients required more than one hysteroscopic resection. Two patients had uterine perforation, uh, one actually had hemorrhagic shock and required emergency uterine repair. So their conclusion is that given the limited data, frequency of adverse events and proportion, uh, and patients needing a repeat procedure, routine hysteroscopic resection with or without high intensity focused ultrasonography at that point was not recommended. Okay, so I am interested to find out our subsequent speakers as to how uh, we can uh, sort out this issue, okay? Um, similarly, nothing different from uh, the American guidelines as well. Um, elective peripartum hysterectomy may be unacceptable to women desiring uterine preservation, but, uh, you know, <laughs> if it is considered inappropriate, leaving the placenta inside should be considered, but you need to remember that they can still go into a sudden uh, requirement of a, yeah, um, uh, uh, if it is, if the placenta is left in situ, then you need to monitor that to make sure that uh, they do not have any complications such as a bleeding or infection. Methotrexate adjuvant therapy, we know has been started and been used, but it is, um, their recommendation is that it's not to be used for expectant management as it has unproven benefits and significant adverse effects. But then again, this was added new in 2018. There are papers, there are papers to suggest that it actually works. And I think we will show that later. Okay, so <clears throat> role of interventional radiology, we know that uh, they do that for uterine R3 embolization is also co-performed with a hysteroscopy for such cases, particularly in uh, cesarean scar pregnancies. And they also say that it can uh, perhaps be managed um, if you can control the hemorrhage, okay? And hopefully there is no hemorrhage uh, that we are dealing with. Uh, balloon catheters also suggest, uh, you know, you need further evaluation whether or not we can put a balloon catheter in uh, subsequently in the delivery of a placenta accreta. So, the objective is, of course, to diminish blood loss, to diminish blood loss and to hasten placenta reabsorption. Okay, that is the idea of this conservative or expectant management. But uh, uterine devascularization, that means you, you stop the blood supply. The principle is to put in a balloon, you know, balloon placement within the uterine artery, or you might want to embolize the uterine artery, or even for that matter, ligate. So, uh, the whole idea is actually to stop this blood loss. Now, post-delivery methotrexate is also another technique that people do. This is supposed to help with the placental involution, shrinking, and resorption by the system. 
And there are also people who suggest and they do a delay interval hysterectomy, which is later. So that is also up for discussion uh, within this uh, webinar session, I reckon. So in summary, placental accreta spectrum is increasingly common and I have done a lot of reading, particularly within the uh, Chinese nation where now they have a two child, uh, prince, uh, what do you call it? A two, chill, uh, two child uh, concept that uh, cesarean sections are more common. So on the range of about one to 2,000 uh, cases, you may have a cesarean scar pregnancy, for example, which we are going to cover after this. But we also know that it is a significant mobility and mortality. And so at this point in time, with a PAS, a placental accreta spectrum, we know that we need to know the risk factors. We need to know the antenatal imaging. Okay, We understand that a cesarean hysterectomy could be the penultimate or the a uh, final uh, procedure that needs to be done, okay, uh, then it is the most accepted approach by many at this point in time. So if we are talking about a conservative management or expectant management, it is only for carefully selected cases, okay, after detailed counselling. And at this point in time, the recommendation is that it is only considered as investigational. All right, so now let's get into the cesarean scar pregnancy. It is rare, very rare, but nevertheless, it does happen. And out of 500 plus uh, cesarean scars, there could be one which ends up with a uh, cesarean scar pregnancy. Some say that it is almost like an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, now usually diagnosed within the first trimester. And if you do not treat it, it subsequently can become part of a placental accreta spectrum. Okay, so the gestational sac, okay, is embedded in the uterine window at the site of the actual cesarean scar where you actually perform the caesar. So if you allow this pregnancy to happen, all right, the risk of placenta accreta spectrum is just 100%. All right, so there are criteria to it. Okay, so one is that when you put it on ultrasonography, I will show you the pictures. Okay. So on the ultrasonography, you will see the criteria will be an empty uterus with a good endometrial lining that you can see. Perhaps a gestational sac at the end near to the isthmus, okay? And you will see if you put on the Doppler, peritrophoblastic invasion and the Doppler that is actually vascularization within the area of this isthmus. And if it is a, a bit more advanced, you can also see thinning of the myometrium and the um, plane between the myometrium and the bladder can actually be compromised. Okay, so the Chinese Medical Society have actually uh, typed, the, uh, they have, uh, they have uh, categorized the uh, cesarean sections uh, pregnancy, um, cesarean scar pregnancy into three. Uh, one, which is closer, Okay, closer, mostly located within the uterine cavity, but some of it, okay, it's, it's closer. And then uh, type two, uh, partially implanted, but um, majority of it is still within the myometrium. And type three, where it is almost extruding outwards, okay, extruding outwards, uh, and uh, it almost appears uh, like it is towards the bladder. Okay, so you can see, you can see the myometrium is really significantly thinner. So that's a type one, two, and three. So very much the current novel approaches depend on the grade of the, um, the grade of the um, CSP, grade of the CSP. All right. So again, I'm going to recap the diagnosis is an empty uterine cavity. Okay, clearly visible endometrium. You see the gestational sac at the anterior isthmus or the caesarean scar. There is a lack or diminished myometrium between the bladder wall and the mass. Okay, or it could be like a complete discontinuity. You, you can't see the anterior muscular tissue. And when you do a Doppler, you can see high blood flow, high velocity, but a low impedance of the peritrophoblastic flow surrounding the gestational sac. 
Okay. And one test that you can do is that when you apply gentle pressure to the cervix, the gestational sac does not slide. So that means it is, you know, part of it. It's part of it. All right. So here are some pictures to suggest. Here, empty uterus with the endometrial lining. You can see here the sac, endometrial lining, and the bladder pretty near. All right. Velocity, high velocity, low impedance, peritrophoblastic invasion, blood supply over here. All right. And um, so I sometimes feel like it is easier to relate if there is a case. So I picked up a case that happened to us uh, this year within the University of Malaya Medical Center where she was a 43-year-old gravida 4 para 2 plus 1 who actually underwent assisted reproductive therapy because of an unexplained secondary infertility. And what happened was that she presented at 21 weeks in this pregnancy with a persistent vaginal bleeding for a month. So when we scanned her, and that was at 16 weeks, you know, an early scan, it was a, you know, a small uh, fetus with a low-lying placenta. So of course, the idea was to admit her for a threatened miscarriage. She was treated with eutrogestin, dufaston, NTD, and the sort. But she had multiple episodes of per vaginal bleeding. So at that point, at 25 weeks, we thought, okay, this could be antipartum hemorrhage due to a low-lying placenta. She was administered steroids. But as weeks went by, the serial scans, we were even more suspicious of this placenta accreta spectrum. So could this actually be a cesarean scar pregnancy? And then what happened was that she was kept in the ward for the longest time until she was about 35 weeks, okay? And she had one episode of per vaginal fluid. So we knew at that point it was a PPROM. It was a pre-labor, premature rupture of membranes. And she underwent a cesarean section and what we found was that there was placental invasion at the uterine serosa. So she bled. She bled for about two liters. We had to transfuse her with one pint of packed cells. And when the cesarean hysterectomy was completed, we sent it for a histopathological um, examination. It came back as placenta inclita with adenomyoma. So can we see here that there is a loss of plane between the bladder okay, and the uterus. This was what we had. We had a CT scan, an MRI, a CT scan, CT scan of this patient. It's a loss of plane. Okay. And this was the resultant hysterectomy. So the baby was delivered, but nevertheless, we chose not to save the uterus because uh, for fear of bleeding. And you can see the really thin uh, border there. Okay. And that was the placenta. All right. That was the placenta. So when we go through protocols and how, um, you know, uh, around the world, what do people do? Um, I picked up this study, which, you know, looks at what happens when you have a cesarean, uh, cesarean scar pregnancy with a positive fetal heartbeat or with a negative fetal heartbeat. But um, what came about was that, um, well, almost 40% had severe bleeding. And if they did progress to the third trimester, some ended up with a uterine rupture, um, hysterectomy, unfortunately, well, there was no maternal death here. But with the negative fetal heart, even if they wanted to perform a conservative management, and usually this was within the first to the second trimester, they do undergo, um, okay, yes, many actually just have like an uncomplicated miscarriage, um, but there are about 30% or so which ended up with a complicated miscarriage. Thank God there was no hysterectomy needed or maternal death. So a Turkish study came out with this protocol where if you do have a cesarean scar pregnancy and the algorithm is as such that if there is a fetal heart and you know if your patient requires for a termination of pregnancy, then you've got to think about the most appropriate treatment. Okay. If they want to continue the pregnancy, then we have to de decide whether this is high risk for 
uh, in crita, per crita, and risk of cesarean uh, hysterectomy, or if it is at the scar itself, uh, what do we do? Is it low risk? If there is no fetal heart, the protocol suggests that um, you, you follow through, follow through until the beta HCG becomes zero. All right. So in summary, if you have a positive fetal heart with the cesarean scar pregnancy, you are worried about now severe hemorrhage, early uterine rupture, hysterectomy, and uh, severe uh, bleeding, okay? Um, if, okay, there is a significant proportion that may go to term like the patient that we had, um, you know, it is questionable whether termination should be the only therapeutic option that is offered. Uh, maybe they, they don't, they don't have to be terminated, all right? But with the negative fetal heart, expectant management can be a reasonable option, all right, in view of low likelihood of uh, maternal complications as we showed just now. But patients still need to have a close surveillance, okay, to make sure that there is no uh, severe outcome. So with regards to treatment modality, um, we look through the literature and what we can find is expectant management, systemic or local, Methotrexate, you know, systemic is through the intravenous or uh, systemic, sorry, not intravenous, it's systemic as usual. Uh, and the local is actually guided, after some guided into the uh, area of the suspected uh, cesarean scar pregnancy. Some do needle aspiration with MPX. Okay, uterine curettage seems to be quite commonly done. Uh, hysteroscopy. Some even try to do, and this is a novel idea, of a transvaginal curettage. So between the border of the cervix and the anterior fornix, a, uh, a transverse, uh, uh, transverse resection is made where it is then uh, you know, um, uh, removed, uh, but it's novel. Then you have the uterine artery embolization followed by the curettage and hysteroscopy. Um, I would be most comfortable with the laparoscopic cesarean scar resection, push the bladder down and then locate the area, perhaps with vasopressin and cut the area and suture it back. That would be good for the type three of the cesarean scar pregnancy. And um, <clears throat> many have also reported cases of repeated high full ablation, okay, high intensity frequency ultrasound, and also making a pairing of high full plus as hysteroscopic uh, suction and curettage. So let's wait and see what the other speakers have said. So we looked at it. Um, systemic review shows that there are so many ways, okay, there are more than one way to skin a cat. So many ways. And even in this group where the first protocol was a wedge resection, okay, just to remove the, the area, uh, protocol two was a suction curettage. Okay, so protocol one is uh, laparoscopically done, suction curettage, uh, trans uh, hysteroscopically, systemic methotrexate. Protocol four is systemic plus local methotrexate, but inevitably it did not show major differences. Um, nothing much different aside from hemoglobin levels because perhaps the surgical ones did probably there's a drop of hemoglobin, but in terms of uh, days of discharge in terms of waiting for the beta ECG levels to come down. Um, the beta ECG levels come down slower within those with the methotrexate uh, format. Okay, so um, summary says that there are not really much significant differences. So the best would actually to select the most appropriate protocol after discussing with your patient. Okay. All right, so here are my references. And this is the lady whom uh, had that placenta accreta in Krita, and she has uh, survived, uh, thank God. And she is now a spokesperson for a blood uh, donation. Um, and that is the, uh, you know, the, 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 the joyful baby uh, that came out of it and who stayed with us for the duration that she had to stay within the hospital. 
So um, I hope I have managed to define and uh, tell us, uh, you know, remind each other where we actually stand. And perhaps at the end of this uh, webinar, we can close the gap by getting new and a little bit more predetermined ideas on what we shall do with cesarean pregnancies, um, cesarean scar pregnancies. Thank you very, very much. Yes, thank you, Dr. Aruna. Uh, it's wonderful, very wonderful, very wonderful topic. Is there any question? <coughs> mm. Aruna, actually, I have one question. Yes. Uh, you ever talk about talk talk about the uh, uh, trend the um, about the uterine artery uh, embolization, right? Yes. Uh, if the patient uh, have one more baby, mm. do you do you no do you use the TA? No, yes, no. you are very right. Thank you, uh, Prof. Chi, for explain, uh, for highlighting that. Uterine mm -hmm. artery embolization, we have to counsel the patient that we do not know its effects on the uterine, uh, on the endometrial uh, function and quality subsequently. So if they are mm -hmm. in need for another uh, uh, a child, uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we have our reservations to, to promote that idea. Okay, well. Because so of the I have that, embolization. Yeah, great. Okay, I have the other question. Yes, do you use the Dopra uh, to check the accreta or increta or cesarean section scar precans the the blood flow? Do you use? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. Doppler, any ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Any comment about the Dopra flow? Because actually, it is not maybe it's not mm, give you. A uh, debris diagnosis because maybe there is the neovascularization. Do you Correct. have any experience about that? Well, um, we don't get many cesarean scar pregnancies. Uh, so the one, two that comes to us, most of it is basically a ultrasound, uh, as I said, the criteria to see the location. Uh, the Doppler is like an adjuvant or an additional help, if any, um, but you, you might be right. Yes, you are right, because uh, sometimes the vascularization can be also impaired. Um, we have not yet used the MRI, but uh, it is being suggested that MRI is, is, is uh, uh, recommended. Uh, what is your opinion? Do you, do you use, do you depend on that? Um. Actually, I don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, my experience here yeah, is if you use the Dopra flow to check the flow, yep. but actually just give you um, some message only. Sometimes it's very severe, but you uh, get inside, maybe you open laparotomy, but it is the very soft adhesion only. So I can remove the greater the placenta very easy. At that time, I always say that, science car. Science car help this mother. Yeah. yeah. Is there any question? Uh, Professor Chushumi, do you have any experience and any comment to us? Yeah. Uh, I, I, oh, thank you uh, for your very beautiful presentation. And uh, I am... Uh, interested in uh, expectant or conservative management of uh, placenta greater. And you have shown uh, MTX and uh, HIFU. Do, do, do you, you yourself have experience or some, do you know some paper uh, uh, describing this procedure? Uh, there are quite a few papers describing the usage of MTX uh, with curatage, but I have not seen MTX with Haifu. Mm -hmm. yes. Not yet. Yeah, no, I've, I've not seen that. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I was looking through there because 
there are not many cases. I mean, I touch wood, I thank God, I don't get many cases of such in my practice. So I was looking at all the papers and, uh, and, and there is a lot of usage of MTX followed by Curitage. But interestingly, as you said, Professor Sumi, there is no MTX plus HIFU. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that it may work? Is it necessary? Because I would have thought HIFU would, you know, act on it immediately already you yeah. go to MTX. Yeah, so, MTX maybe get it smaller and HIFU uh, uh, maybe acting uh, smaller. More smaller. smaller, and finally, maybe uh, hysteroscopic remover, maybe Co combi in combination of yeah. many treatment. The literature also suggests that the gestational sac is only approximately, maximally about nine millimeters. So it's ah. you know it's not maybe so it's big more. in the okay. first place. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, mm -hmm. so so that's that. Sorry, we are talking about a cesarean scar pregnancy, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> Professor Tsuchumi, do, yes. do you have any MTS for scar pregnancy experience? Do you? Uh, my, I, my I have no experience of the okay. uh, usage of scar. Okay. Uh, but uh, we sometimes use MTX for placenta rest or ectopic yeah, pregnancy. Yeah. And uh, recently, we are going to try uh, GnRH antagonist or okay. agonist to reduce uh, hormone level. Mm -hmm. We are now trying it. So we, I have Paul Atana. So if you have the pregnancy the in Krita, placenta in Krita or Krita, after surgery, the mm -hmm. patient is good, very good. And, uh, and the recovery, wonderful. After that, do you use the MTS injection for her? No, no. not in my practice, not so, in practice. Okay, so if the patient want the other, the children or the other baby, do you recommend or you do something for her? That is very controversial. Uh, yeah, Dr. It is. <laughs> that is very controversial because I think then um, we, we, we have not much experience. We don't use MTX for placental resorption. We say that we try to preserve the uterus, but inevitably it is still life over pregnancy. So I think most of our patients also, they understand in that yeah. sense, yeah. Actually, the MTS, the other problem uh, is uh, how many dose do you use? Local ejection or general ejection, IM ejection, or how many dose you use? That is, is the problem. Is there any question? It's a wonderful topic. Is there anyone comment or any question? Okay. If you have no any question, we- Hello. Hi, Hi yeah. everybody. Yeah, okay. You Can are you Zina, right? Me? Zina? You are Zina, right? Do you Hello, have can you listen to me? Yes, I can. Ah, thank you? you very much for, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful, wonderful lecture. And just I am uh, wondering that is there any any prevention, preventive role during C-section to prevent the scar pregnancy? My first question. And the second question is that the most of the literature says that the role of uh, MTS, that is methotrexate, is really insignificant. So um, uh, how far it is true? That's two question to Dr. Uh, Ziza, which is wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ziza. Um, I, I agree, uh, literature also says that the role of MTX is uh, questionable because uh, in most of their treatment protocols, they actually incorporate the uh, suction and cure touch or a hysteroscopic evacuation. That's one. So yes, I, 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 I question that as well. Uh, with regards to uh, cesarean uh, scar incision and repair, um, I came across something quite interesting. It says that nowadays people are 
uh, suturing only one layer. Is is that common? One layer. One layer. So I don't know. I mean here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's many, many obstetricians they like that, but I don't do personality. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the the literature review says that if you have five hundred uh, cesarean sections, uh, scars, uh, you know. Uh, maybe one will end up, but I, I, I think that number is, no, it's not one in 500, it's like one in 2,000 or so. So that's quite rare. Uh, one will end up in cesarean scar pregnancy. But I think the fact that it is such a rare uh, occurrence as well, it's a bit difficult. <clears throat> it's a bit difficult to find studies and recommendation. Do you have any suggestions yourself, Zina? Maybe you have suggestions on how to improve uh, uh, Cesareans. Well, uh, actually, I didn't. I didn't find anything in the literature. That's why I, why I was wondering that probably you will I know better than me. Yeah. <laughs> I came across it's one in two thousand Caesars, and apparently uh, it is rising now because more and more people are opting for cesarean section. Yeah. Okay, it's true. Mm. That's true. Mm -hmm. I was okay. yesterday in our surgery congress in the London. And they also discussed a, a huge say, one hour session on PAS. So Khalid uh, from Saudi Arabia, he uh, delivered an excellent lecture. What he suggested that, uh, yeah, you, you can draw a line on the scar or on the PAS. If it is above the scar, probably it is, it is it, you can allow the patient to continue pregnancy it is not that not that dangerous but if the scar of pregnancy below the line that line is dividing oh. the uterus into two parts so that is a wonderful message what we learned yesterday from the rcg congress in london thank you thank you okay uh, i afraid we will must go to the, the other session